Watch that you fall not into temptation. See, that, that gets skipped over a lot of times. He said, watch so that you don't fall into temptation. The message this morning, I, I don't expect you to receive it. I don't want to hear it. And neither do you. Because waiting is one of the awfulest things that we have to do. Waiting in a doctor's office, waiting for the test results of yourself or your child. The last thing you heard was, it looks like cancer. Come back next week and we'll have the test results. That week is six months long. Or maybe you're on vacation and your wife is shopping. Or maybe your husband is in the Great Smoky Mountain Knife Works. And you're like, my gosh, it's been over an hour. Wait a minute. Okay, a minute. But anyway, waiting is something that we just absolutely don't enjoy. Our ancestors got on horses and buggies and took a year to get to the west. Now we can buy a ticket and be there, what, four hours? In 15, we went to Israel. What would have took years, maybe? We flew into Paris in nine hours and then four and a half hours into Tel Aviv. And that was the longest time in my life. Don't ever let anybody else buy your plane tickets. Because we sat at the very back of the plane, right in front of the restroom, and there was this much room for your legs. And I thought, it's worth it to pay more. Waiting. If you'll notice the scripture of Moses, Moses has went up onto the mountain to speak to God, and the children of Israel got tired of waiting. It said they waited. If you'll read the scripture, it said they seen lightning and smoke coming and billowing off of the mountain. They could hear the thunder of God's voice. They could hear all this going on, and yet they waited. And after a while, they said, we realize that Moses has went up to speak to God, but while we wait, make us a God. We need a God that we can follow. The God that led us through Moses out of Egypt, we understand that. But while we wait, we need a God that we can worship. We need a God. And the Bible said that He took the gold from the earrings, and yes, there's a scripture in there you don't like. It said, take the gold from your wives' ears and your daughters and your sons. And He said, He melted them down and He formed a golden calf. And there was a great transformation that happened. The Bible said they met together, they broke bread together, and they, they took and they brought offerings unto the altar. And the Bible said that they said, this is the God that led us out of bondage. Just a few scriptures before, it was the God of Moses that led them out of Egypt. And a transformation happened because they couldn't see the God of Moses, but they could see the God that they sat and watched Him make with His own hands out of the own earrings, and they brought burnt offerings and sacrifices and the transformation from this God. And it even says in the Scripture with the little g, make us gods that we can follow. And the things that God had blessed them with they now took that away from God Almighty and they placed it on that golden calf and said, this, this is what makes us whole. This is what completes us. This is what my heart has been yearning for. Waiting.
As Steve paused, I didn't tell him to do that. As Steve paused, and as I prayed with some at the altar, and I backed up and got my place, and Steve said, let's be quiet for just a minute. And I'm thinking, a minute? A whole minute? And I looked up at him, and his head was down. And I stood there, and I'm like, okay, Steve, been a minute. It's been a minute. Steve, it's been a minute. It's been two minutes, Steve. Come on now. We're, we're, we're on the air. People's going to turn in and think that there's nothing going on. It's this dead space. We're having technical difficulty. Our anxiousness builds inside of us to the point that at a split second of we're not being entertained, we'll whip out that phone and we'll go looking at something. Our mothers and fathers, if they was in the hospital, had crossword puzzles. They even bring you a newspaper in the hospital so you can read and pass the time. And our, even our kids go, Dad, are we going to church? Lord, He talks so long. But they can watch five hours of cartoons without moving. I mean, fix a sandwich, get something to drink, go to the restroom, and still never make their eyes off a of television. But one one-hour service is like a full day long. Focus. Pray that you might not come into temptation. Church, I think this is one of the hardest things God ever asks us to do. Especially in this time. We're going to take a vacation at the end of August and I can't wait. I need one bad. And is this going to be a short one? But about every three days, I, I, I get an email that says, only 123 days. And I'm like, really? And I think it goes up every time when it's supposed to be going down. And I thought to myself, to wait is hard. All of my Christian life, since I was 19 years old, I've gotten tired of waiting when, when God called me to preach, uh, I come before God and I said, God, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. And he said, no, that's okay. And so I waited. Six months later, uh, the pressure built and I come to the altar and I, I said, God, I know this is what you want me to do. I know you want me to preach. And Lord, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. And God said, no, that's okay. I went through this six times. And every time it got a little shorter and a little shorter and a little shorter and to the point where I was fixing to backslide and go completely against God or something was going to give because I was tired of the cat and mouse game with God calling me to preach and the pressure building into what it was building to and me finally hitting a place of desperation and crying out, God, I'll do it. And God said, no, that's okay. And finally, the last time, I was sitting on a church bench on the front row on this side. And the pressure had built to the point me and Patsy couldn't look at one another. Couldn't stand her. And she couldn't stand me. I went to a lawyer and talked about bankruptcy. I went to a lawyer, same lawyer, and talked about a divorce. I was miserable, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I did not enjoy being alive, but yet I am a Christian, and I am a man of God who studies and prays, and I'd gotten to the point so desperate. And that morning on the bench, I said, God, I can't go any further if that's what you want me to do. And God said, that's what I want you to do. And I leapt to my feet with tears and everything flowing. I was a mess. And I stood up one day and I said, 
God's called me to preach. And the church went to shouting. There was people shouting and running over. And I mean, I ended up in the altar and it was more like I scored a touchdown than it was anything. There was people piled on top of me. And I never will forget that feeling. And But I was still angry at God. I said, God, why? I was willing to... Three years ago, why did you play these cat and mouse games with me? Why did you do me this way? It felt so cruel and unusual that when God would ask me to do something and I would say I would do it, why would you say no? God wasn't really saying no. He was saying wait. Because you see, the man that he started calling three years ago, if he would have preached then, it would have been about his message. It would have been about what he did. It would have been about how good or how bad it was. It would have been about the version of the Bible. It would have been about how long did he preach. It would have been about me. And God knew the last thing it needed to be was about me. And so he built me up to the point I would just shake like a leaf and say, God, I'll do it. He wasn't saying no. He was saying, wait. Wait. Why is he being so cruel to me? And then the time I preached my first message, I don't know how long it was. I didn't care. I couldn't tell you how many people was in the church. I didn't care. I didn't, I didn't know how many come to the altar. I didn't care because all I knew was that what I was doing was God's thing and God's time and God's message and God's way. And that's what made me complete. I think America, especially the South, has changed. I told you this last week. We changed from no longer being the Bible belt to the sports belt. Because we're tired of waiting. We're tired of waiting on God. Our grandmothers and grandfathers just knew that God, that the world couldn't get any worse than what it was and that God was coming back in their lifetime. And we went and we buried them and we cried over them. And then we buried our mothers and daddies who thought that God was coming back in their time. Even Paul writes, he said that there's some in this generation that will see the return of God. Paul thought God was coming back. Christ was coming back. Even in his day, he thought he was coming back. And church, I'll be honest with you, I sometimes I get tired of waiting one day when I was praying several years ago I'd done my usual thing I repented of any and all and may have even named a few and I said God come back right now I'm ready Lord come back right now And God said, what about the billions of people that will die and go to hell without me? You're ready. But they're not. And ever since then, we may not get to Matthew. That's okay. Ever since then, it has been a continuous up and down life of Mark Mayo. And you know what? It has been of Steve too. Because things come into our lives like that golden calf that gets our attentions and it's so sweet and it's so precious and it's so innocent that my mind gets over there somewhere and I realize it's not where it should be. One of the first things that got in my eye was a beautiful 18-year-old redhead which was the most prettiest thing I'd ever seen in my life. One night I had a dream. I dreamed that I buried everybody I knew. I mean family. Didn't bother me a bit. I didn't like most of them anyway. The last one I seen was Patsy's head laying on that white pillow. And her hair was spread out over it. And I woke up squalling. And I knew... That's who God wanted me to marry. 
because out of all the human beings on this planet at that time, she meant the most to me. And I knew God had sent her to me. And there's been a few times that I've worshipped her. You hear that quietness? I have. And then I had to repent. After we'd been married two years, we had a beautiful baby girl. Prettiest thing I ever laid my eyes on. And I worshipped her. I thank God for her. But there was times when I put her higher than I put God. I remember we were looking at new trailers. All I ever lived in was a trailer, was y'all. That's all I ever knew. Patsy and I got married. We we moved into a just a trailer, seventy nine model, old, wore out piece of junk, but it was all I could afford and after a few years, we went to looking at new house trailers. And one of my church members, I wasn't pastor, just, just a regular church person, he come to me and said, won't you let me build you a house? And I said, I can't afford a house. He said, I can build you a house cheaper than you can buy a house trailer. And I remember buying a piece of dirt. And I remember going over there and they had poured the fitter, a footer. Man, I just stood there in my driveway and I thought, wow, I'm going to have a house. And I watched that house slowly get built. Day in and day out. I'd go by there every day. Because I wanted to see what they got done today because I... This old trailer park trash. I was going to have a house that was going to be called mine. And people would come down the road and they would stop and admire my house. And I worshipped it. Then we had... A beautiful baby girl, another one. And I worshipped her. Quiet, innocent, precious, precious, precious. She never cried. She never had any problems. What never was sick. She was always there. And while she was still in diapers, we found out we were finished. And God said, no, you need two more. And so God gave us twins, so I've got this little dark-haired girl, this little precious blonde-haired girl still in diapers, and now I'm toting two twins. In my house, on my land. And I worship them. I did. You say, well, Brother Mark, you've matured a lot. You, you've grown up a lot now. You, you've been pastoring and preaching for 20-something years, so surely you're, you're past the point of temptation. Well, as you know, three months ago I got my first grandbaby. He's so much cuter than all y'all's grandkids. For three months I went home every weekend to lay my hands on him for three solid months. And I was miserable every time I went because they live in center. And every time I would get there, I never understood it till right now. God would call me. He said, you need to be in Gunnersville. And my kids would get upset with me because I become anxious to get back here. And they don't understand. But you see, for three months, on Friday, I left this house, went straight to their house, and I held him 
all day Friday. I told her to go away. And I just wanted to see him. He can pitch a fit. He can scream. He can do anything he wants to. I don't care. I just want him in my hands. Friday of this week, I didn't go back. I stayed here. Because if I'm not careful, I will worship Him. Did you hear that? The children of Israel got tired of waiting on Moses. And so they had to have something that they could lay their hands on. They had to have something that they could put their eyes on. They had to have something that they could grasp and say, that is God. A couple of months ago at CR, I didn't even realize what I was doing. I just did it. And I've already told some of you this. I said, roll tide. Whole place lit up. Roll tide! I said, praise God. Yeah, buddy. And it just struck me. What? And so I did it again. Never crossed my mind. And I said, War Eagle! War Eagle! And some of them, you know, had that look on their face. Praise God. And I told them, I said, if our roll tide and our war eagle is louder than our praise God church, we got a problem. We got a problem. If we're showing pictures of our kids and our grandkids more than we're telling them about Christ and forgiveness, Houston, we, we got a problem. And it's not a your problem. It's a my problem. When we move to Gunnersville, we may not take communion. Y'all may have to stay for 945. When we, when we, when we moved to Gunnersville, the staff and everybody, the first question they wanted to know is, where'd you buy a house? Where'd you buy a house? Working on it. Where'd you buy a house? Bought a house on Obrig. Obrig. Oh, okay. Uh, on, on this side of 69? No. On that side of 69? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Changes the whole dynamics of where you're at. And church is a battle that I fight daily, hourly. Brother Ricky called me into his office a couple of months ago and he said, I want you to listen to something. And it was me preaching. And it, I said, I don't care about the 945 service. I don't care about the 830 service and I don't care about the 11 o'clock service. Brother Ricky said, is that what you meant to say? I said, no. Because if I'm not careful, I'll let the 8.30 service become my God. The 9.45 and the 8.30 and 11 o'clock service, they're just as much God's church as this one is. No more, no less. And we're all in this thing together. And that's doing our best to be pleasing unto God. I'm telling you this morning that this Scripture is so Today, people say, well, I don't understand the Old Testament. You understand this, because if I'm not careful, I will take the blessings that God has given me, and all of a sudden, this three-month-old is the one that given to me. It brings me peace. He brings me happiness. He makes me smile. When I'm looking into His eyes, all of my troubles go away. You know why? Because I don't have to wait anymore. I've got him in my hands. 
They even bought him a shirt. I'm Pop, by the way. It says something, a popsicle or something. Pop is the greatest sickle or something. I don't know. So, my question this morning is what are you doing while you wait? What are you doing while you wait? And for me, in my house, it's a continuous evaluation. The Ten Commandments was a lot. The laws were a lot. Jesus said, let me just break it down for you. That even Mark Mayo can understand it. He said, I want you to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. He said, the second one is likened to the first, to love thy neighbor as thyself. Guys, the two hardest things there is for me to do in my life is to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, with all that I... It's easy for me to say. I love the Lord, Brother Mark. Hey, I love Him. My checkbook don't represent it. The time I spend in prayer don't represent it. The time I spend in the Bible don't represent it. My bumper in my car don't represent it. The shirts I wear don't represent it. But I love Him. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. And to love my neighbor as myself. Really? Do you even know your neighbor? Do you want to? Waiting. 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 Church this morning, he said the focus. Pray, watch, that we come not into temptation. As the servants come this morning, well, wait a minute. There was a reason why Christ was so dramatic about this being His body and His blood. He wanted to do something that would never be forgotten. And even in our life in 2019, it's so shocking to us that somebody would love us enough to to say this is my body which is broken for you take eat father we lift up the bread before you this morning of all the things that try